On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to discuss an article written by Gary Sturman for our October magazine on the subject of time dilation. Gary is here to discuss with me Joshua's great leap in time. Mm. And by the way, JR, it really happened. Joshua and his troops experienced something that today's scientists call time dilation. And, and I think we can make a pretty good case for that. Here's a, uh, an example of some, uh, something being written and discussed today. Dr. Paul Davies, a book, How to Build a Time Machine. Now, Paul Davies is a, uh, an accomplished, uh, advanced mathematician. Uh, here's one by Dr. Richard J. Gott, Time Travel in Einstein's Universe. A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. We have uh, one here called Hyperspace by Michio Kaku. Now, J.R., in all of these books, and these are just a small sampling of the books being written today, uh, there is the firm belief as expressed through modern math and physics that time is a flexible commodity. We think of it as stable and solid. Today's physicists say that light is stable, time is flexible, pliable, something that you can stretch, you, something yes. you can squeeze together, you can turn it, twist it, and they actually believe and teach this and they're working on time travel today. Now, back in 1971, two scientists performed an experiment which uh, seemed to prove this uh, theory possible. Tell us about it. Well, in 1971, uh, a couple of physicists, uh, their, their names are well known, Joe Hafala and Richard uh, Keating, uh, demonstrated uh, Einstein's slowing of time in moving objects. Einstein uh, had posited that if, as, as an, a physical object approaches the speed of light, it begins to slow down in time. That is, it experiences time at a slower rate than something that's, that's standing still. <clears throat> and so what they did, they put a couple of atomic clocks aboard an airline type jet, flew it up around 45, 50,000 feet toward the east, which means they added the speed of the Earth's rotation to the jet speed. And they flew for a while, <clears throat> and they had a couple of other like clocks on the ground that were moving uh, only as fast as the Earth is rotating. So in other words, the clocks in the air are going a lot faster. Well, after uh, a period of flight, they landed, compared the clocks, and discovered <clears throat> that the, the clocks that had been flying in the airplane were slightly slower by 59 nanoseconds. Now that's just a few billionths of a second, JR, but what it shows is that what we call now is not necessarily now. That is, the now in that airplane was not the same as the now on planet Earth. And it's this t idea of time flexibility that intrigues modern science. Now when Einstein postulated his theory on relativity, he set uh, the speed of light as the constant. In fact, mm -hmm. it was shown as a C right. for constant. <clears throat> Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Well, the speed of light is constant in that it is the commodity by which all other things are measured. Now, that formula, JR, has mass in it, the M. <clears throat> it has uh, light, the C. And it has the big E. E equals MC squared. It has energy. Mm -hmm. Energy and mass, not constant at all, quite, quite interchangeable, but the C doesn't change. It's the speed of light. And JR, the one thing that strikes me as I read these, these uh, theories and, and these formulations is, is 1 John 1, 5, where it says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is a creature of light. Well, if this is true, then God is shall we say, the C in the Einstein's formula. He is the constant. Now, back in Genesis chapter 1, on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. So in this universe, there was no light. At least none around the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Mm -hmm. God spoke light into existence, but he created the sun on the fourth day. So what was this light? Was it God? Was it God's presence? Well, I'm reminded of the New Jerusalem, where uh, eventually we will reside as the redeemed. Uh, uh, the New Jerusalem has no need of the sun. 
because uh, the Father is the light of that place. The Lamb is the light of that place. Uh, I think this takes us all the way back to the first day of creation. He, so we're talking primeval light. We're here. talking primeval light. In other words, the light that exists without combustion or nuclear energy in a star or, or electric generators. It's, it is the light of God. It is the ultimate constant and it is eternity. It's what the Bible refers to as eternity. In other words, if you're where he is, mm -hmm. you're going to be living in that constant regime uh, uh, where time uh, is stable because he's stable. Okay, Moses wrote to the six days of creation as 24-hour days, six 24-hour days. And according to Flavius Josephus, first century Jewish historian, uh, Moses wrote of these and uh, said that uh, the seventh day was a rest and released from such operations. And then he says, moreover, Moses, after the seventh day was over, begins to talk philosophically concerning the formation of man, says that God took dust to the ground, formed man, and so on. Um, what, we're, what we're looking at here by Flavius Josephus is that when Moses spoke of the six days of creation, he was adamant. No, no mystery there. They were six 24-hour Earth days. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there are those who suggest that those days on Earth were not necessarily the same in the rest of the universe because of this pliability of time, time dilation. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. Well, if you have light as constant, and if you read in Genesis 1-3 where the, the God said, let there be light, <coughs> Uh, that's equivalent to saying, let there be a constant state. And everything is measured by that. And J.R., very soon, you see that God divides the light from the darkness. He calls the light day, the darkness night. And very shortly thereafter, we have this phrase, the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, there's no sun at this time. In other words, the sun, the moon, the stars hadn't even been created yet. Mm -hmm. And yet he says, the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, how do you regulate or how do you determine evening and morning when there's no sun and no moon? Mm -hmm. you, you do that because God himself is the measure of evening and morning. And he divides his own light in order to create that evening and morning. The question is, how long? would that first evening and morning be? A lot of people say, well, it's a 24-hour evening and morning. Uh, how could it be a 24-hour evening and morning if there's not yet a sun or a moon? And <clears throat> physicists continually look at this universe and their, their observations tell them mm -hmm. that things are vastly, vastly arrayed in this universe mm -hmm. in terms of hundreds of thousands of light years, uh, billions of years uh, uh, in, rate, in reach if you travel at the speed of light uh, across a known portion of the universe. And so they're used to thinking in terms of large, long expanses. They come to the Bible and suddenly you see six 24 hours a day and you say, wait a minute. The universe appears to have taken longer than six 24-hour days to uh, have come into existence. Were those real 24-hour days or were they somehow dilated in time and they're 24-hour days from God's perspective? That's the big question. Mm -hmm. Now, there is an author of a book. His name is Dr. Gerald Schroeder, his book, The Science of God, wherein, uh, and by the way, he's from MIT, isn't he? Yes. And he gives this explanation. Now, we're not here to uh, adopt his explanation, but uh, simply in the uh, light of the possibility of time travel or time dilation. And we know that there are time travelers of the Bible. Um, we, we're going to be talking about Joshua's long day. So let's talk about Schroeder and his hypothesis for a moment. Yeah, and we do this not to endorse his hypothesis, but simply to present a lot of the contemporary thinking that's going on. And, and uh, to make it as simple as possible, Dr. Schroeder mathematically uh, suggests that the universe is 15 and 3 quarters billion years old, but that it was 
in its earliest moments of creation, when God said, let there be light, it was moving outward mm -hmm. in perhaps in all directions at an enormous rate of speed so quickly that at that speed, time is radically dilated. He suggests mathematically that the first 24-hour day from God's perspective was eight billion years long. <laughs> now, it, so we would see that as eight billion years. God mm -hmm. would see it as 24 right. hours. And what happened to the second day? Well, don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. Now, Gary Stearman, in this particular part of his article, uh, subtitles it, A Stretch in Time and Imagination. Dr. Gerald Schroeder says the first day, 24-hour day, mm -hmm. was eight billion years old. What about the second day? The second day, as the expansion of the universe was slowing down, <clears throat> would appear to, to God from the biblical perspective as 24 hours. Uh, the earthly perspective would be 4 billion years. The third day, 2 billion years. The, the uh, uh, fourth day, a billion years. The fifth day, a half billion years. The sixth day, a quarter of a billion years. And near the end of the sixth day, time would have slowed down to the rate that we perceive it today, so that looking back, we see 15 and three quarters billion years, God sees six 24-hour days. And, and they were six 24-hour days, right? Even absolutely. though they might have been 15 billion years long. <clears throat> exactly. And so this is the way modern science, and Dr. Schroeder, by the way, is attempting to understand physics and the Bible, you know, as a unity. Uh, and since he delves into these very, very abstruse mathematical theories, he's got to find a way to make them merge, and this is his way of doing it. Well, J.R., immediately we begin to think of, of uh, time from God's perspective. If he sees eight billion years as a 24-hour day, and of course Moses wrote in Psalm 90 that a thousand uh, years uh, in God's sight are just like yesterday when it's past, or a watch in the night. Uh, we get some idea that God perceives time in a different way than we do. In fact, God lives outside of time so that he can manipulate time any way he wants to. Let's talk about Joshua and his long day. <laughs> oh, yes. Some people say that it was uh, the planet Mars or Venus that right. came roaring by through our solar system and uh, created a um, the Earth's rotation being, um, mm. well, that appeared as if the sun stood still. But in reality, all God has to do is just sort of manipulate a few things, right? That's correct. In the battle there at Gibeon, Joshua and his troops <coughs> needed more time. <laughs> they needed more time to uh -huh. win the battle. And God gave them more time. And he did this, and this is in the 10th chapter of Joshua. We don't have, uh, quote, unquote, time to read the whole thing uh, verbatim right now. <clears throat> Joshua spoke to the Lord, and he said, In the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gib Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, and the people had a until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Now, J.R., the Bible says that, that the sun stayed still there uh, about a whole day. Uh, if you can imagine late evening, the sun is in the west, mm -hmm. the moon is back in the east, having just risen, and they stayed there for about a whole day. Meanwhile, uh, Joshua and his troops are fighting on and they win the battle and for them it is as though they have ventured into the future while the universe stood still. They were gaining time. Now if the sun, if the earth actually had stood still, that is if God had just stopped everything, right. and the momentum of the inertia of the earth, which normally travels a thousand miles an hour, mm -hmm. had continued, then everything on the earth would have been thrown forward at a thousand miles an hour. Indeed. So God had to do something special in order to keep this from happening, which would have destroyed everything on the earth. Now, as J.R. just mentioned, uh, there have been some writers, notably Emmanuel Velikovsky, Worlds in Collision, uh, Donald Wesley Patton, Catastrophism in the Old Testament, 
have suggested that Mars used to be in a, a rather erratic orbit, brought it very close to the, the orbit of Earth, and it caused the Earth to jerk and stop for a little while, accounting for Joshua's long day. But J.R., I kind of think it may have been time dilation in the hands of God, who is, after all, the great constant. He is the master of time space. And it would be nothing He's at all. the keeper all. of the clock. Huh? The keeper of the clock, as it were, yeah. indeed. <laughs> okay, so in the days of Hezekiah, we had a little different situation. Uh, tell us how that fits in with this scheme of things. If well, Joshua uh, was allowed another 12 hours or so, is mm -hmm. it possible that God straightened everything back out in the 7th century B.C.? And this is just a suggestion, uh, but uh, about uh, 750 years after Joshua's event, we come to the period of Isaiah and Hezekiah. It's about 710 B.C. <clears throat> the Assyrians were threatening the kingdom. Hezekiah prayed, <clears throat> and the Lord heard Hezekiah's prayer. And he says, I'm going to deliver this city, but sadly, <clears throat> you're going to die. Hezekiah prayed <clears throat> that he might live on. He was very, very upset about this. And the Lord answered his prayer and said, okay, you can live. And Isaiah came to him and gave him a sign. Uh, Isaiah says, behold, I'll bring the shadow uh, of degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. Isaiah said, that's going to be the sign whereby you'll know you've been healed. So out in the courtyard and the sundial, suddenly it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. and a uh, split second later it was 8 o'clock in the morning. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, something like that. So God just uh, changed the time. Changed the time as a sign to King Hezekiah that he'd been healed. Now, J.R., if back in Joshua's day the people had gone forward in time, uh, and perhaps all the people on earth in that day had gone forward in time by a certain amount. They carried maybe like a, a time credit in their time balance. They had gained some time. And here, in the days of Hezekiah, they lost the time they had gained. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it's fascinating. <clears throat> when Hezekiah was offered this sign, he said, you know, it's, it's a light thing. He said this to Isaiah. He said, it, it is a light thing for the shadow to go down, that is, to go forward by 10 degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow uh, 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Why did Hezekiah say, you know, it would be easy for the Lord to go forward? Yeah. He may have known about Joshua's situation. He may have read the annals, uh, recorded in the book of Jasher, by the way, according to Scripture. And he may have read about that and said, well, it's an easy thing for God to allow people to go forward in time. <clears throat> but I propose that the dial go backward, so we'll go backward in time. And they started this out, say, at 3 in the afternoon. And Maybe they ended up at 8 or 10 in the morning. We don't know for sure. Just 10 steps on the dial, and we don't know how, how they calculated the 10 steps. But we do know that once a moment ago, it was afternoon, and now it's morning. And we've somehow gone back in the past. Now, if the Earth actually turned back yes. or uh, <clears throat> created a... Uh, a different situation than the thousand miles an hour that it presently goes toward uh, toward the east. Uh, it would have thrown everything on the planet off the planet. Indeed. And uh, killed everybody. So that didn't happen. Either in Joshua's day or in Hezekiah's day, God, the great clockmaker, just uh, manipulated time. He is, as we discover from the Bible, the master of time-space. Uh, I believe that while Jesus was on earth, uh, J.R., he might well have manipulated time-space. Uh, we read several of the miracles that seem to involve time uh, in certain ways. So for example, when he appeared and disappeared at will, he could easily have <clears throat> altered uh, the universe of time-space so that he simply disappeared dimensionally or appeared dimensionally. But it m makes no difference because he created the whole thing. He said, let there be light. 
light being that constant, time being fluid and flexible, uh, mm -hmm. Jesus and God the Father are able to control time in this dimension. And mm -hmm. I believe that Joshua, Joshua's experience, Hezekiah's experience uh, may well be uh, great evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Now, the now appears to be eternity dipping into our time mm -hmm. space continuum. Um, and of course, that's, uh, all of this is very difficult to try to comprehend. We're convinced the earth was uh, formed 6,000 years ago by earth time. And within that, there may have been some time dilation that allowed for these other things. Kind of interesting. We know one thing, one of these days we're going to live forever. <laughs> we'll be back in just a moment.